All right, everyone, welcome to clinical orientation for NUR 200 for both spring and summer 2022. Okay, so today we're going to go over lots of different things that you're going to need to know for your clinical experience. Since all four of our groups are going to be at Christiana, we're going to talk specifically about rules that are going to apply to Christiana uh, on and off the floor. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the routines that we're going to have and applying them to different units as well. So we're going to start with, um, with this slide is talks about the necessary things that you need to have before we start clinical. So the first one on there is those certifications and immunizations. So if you receive an email from Helen Cameron, you need to address whatever's in that email because by the end of that month, if it doesn't get back to her that you've completed it, you're not gonna be permitted to go to clinical. So please don't ignore her emails. We, we will give you, you know, try to track you down if you don't have them, but uh, a lot of it is stuff that you have to go either to the doctor or um, you have to get a PPD, whatever it might be. So please don't ignore those emails, get them in, they're very important. If, uh, if there's any mandatory education that you need for Christiana Care, They've changed the way they're doing things now. Um, you're, instead of going into learning space, they're gonna send you an email. So we'll check your email to make sure that you don't have any mandatories due for them. We're gonna assume that you've already read the student handbook and that you've signed your, um, the signature page. Those are all due today. The COVID waiver, the COVID quiz, and the student handbook are all due by two o'clock today. So please have them in. You cannot attend clinical if you don't have that stuff done. Uh, if you did the waiver form, earlier in the year, then it, it should still be there. You shouldn't have to redo anything. You just make sure that, it, that it's showing that you have it complete. Uh, ahead of time, you might wanna try to go into your Christiana Care portal and make sure that your login works because a lot of times the first day of clinical, we do have those issues with um, numbers not working and then we have to spend time on the phone with IT and it's just gonna take away from your clinical experience. We, you know, third semester now, we wanna hit the ground running when we get there next week. So please go in and make sure that everything is working and, and that your badge doesn't need any attention. And then the last one on there, your clinical notebook. Very, very important for you to go through that. It has a lot of great information. It has some refreshers. You can find that on D2L under in the um, content under clinical lab tab, there's the clinical tab, then there's gonna be four different sub tabs for clinical and it's uh, listed in there under, I believe clinical reference. So um, go through that clinical book and, and make sure that you're familiar with everything in there. And it also has specific information for each unit that we're gonna be on. So whichever unit you're gonna be assigned to, go read that unit's information as well. Okay, so hopefully we won't have to experience this. I know it's been 20 degrees in March. However, if any adverse weather happens, we will be in communication via text prior to the start of the clinical day. So for days, that would be 5 a.m. And for evenings, it should be around noon that you hear if um, we are not going to clinical. Please make sure that your clinical instructor has your cell phone number. We will do this um, either, some people do it the first day of clinical, um, some people do it today when we go into breakout rooms. So for math, we already did this yesterday, so it should not be an issue, but I will reiterate, if you scored a less than 85, please contact one of us to schedule a remediation. After that remediation, a remediation is just, we talk, we go over some tips. After that remediation, you can retake in the testing center and you're gonna use their Calendly link to schedule and let us know when you retake so that we can monitor and have the um, exam available for you. At, which, at the point that you score over 85%, then you will be allowed to give medications in clinical. I'm gonna admit this next person, okay. So just some reminders, which we already talked about. So you're going to park in the T-lot. Is anyone unfamiliar with T-lot? Please say it in the chat if you are unfamiliar. T-lot, some people call it the Chick-fil-A lot. It's very similar in location, but on the Christiana side. So you're going to park over in the T-lot and walk through map one. There is a door if it's raining that is close to um, the T-lot, kind of faces the T-lot. And you can go in there and then walk through map one to get to the main hospital. And that's something to just be aware of because um, although it is far away, most of your walk is indoors. 
Remember to wear your mask and practice social distancing. It's still happening within the hospital. And then this eye protection in all clinical areas, bring your eye protection with you in case of splashes, but they are actually not required to be worn um, per Christiana change in policy at all times. So just have them with you in case there is a possibility that someone's going to cough in your eye or they're splashing, et cetera, IV um, splashing, anything, any other kinds of issues there. Okay, so what are you gonna bring to clinical? Um, very important, your student ID and your uh, Christiana badge. If you do not have these when you show up, then you're not gonna be permitted to stay and participate in clinical. It will be a clinical absent, you'll be sent home. So please make sure you have that. Institutions like Christiana, they consider the, the badge part of the uniform. You have to have your badge with you um, in order to participate. You wanna make sure you have your stethoscope and a watch that has a second hand on it so that when you're doing IV pushes, you can keep track of um, your push on your watch. You don't have to rely on the wall clocks because a lot of them, some of them don't work and some of them still haven't been set correctly. So make sure that you have your own watch. As Justine said, surgical masks are still required. If you wear your own mask into the building, then when you get to the floor that you're going to, you're going to have to switch out to a surgical mask. And they will they do have uh, boxes of them around that you can, you can use if you need to. Eye protection is no longer mandatory on all patients. It's just going to be when you would need it. If there's going to be some splashes or if you have a patient, maybe that's spitting, you want to make sure that you have your eye protection. Make sure you have your goggles in your pocket so that when you get in the room, you're ready to go. Clinical paperwork, we're going to talk later in the, the presentation on what you need to bring, but you want to make sure that you have that all printed out and ready to use each clinical day. And we're gonna tell you to keep any personal items, anything that has any value, you should probably keep it in your car because every unit's different. Some floors, um, there, you, your stuff might be in a locked break room, it might not, but people have access to that and we can't guarantee that they're not gonna go in there and, and go through your stuff and take out things. So please only bring in the absolute um, materials that you need and uh, leave all your wallets and cash and all of that in the car. Each individual instructor is going to go over whether you're going to take some kind of meal break. So if you need to bring in some money, you should probably just keep it in your pocket. Okay. Next, professionalism. Uh, we expect that you're all going to be professional. You're not only representing yourself, you're also representing Dell Tech and the nursing program. So we want to make sure that you're, you're doing all the things that you need to do to be professional. Uh, you need to go through the student handbook for the complete guide, but some of the uh, infractions that we see the most is uh, loop earrings. We, you know, remember, you're only allowed to have one piercing in each ear, and it should be a stud earring. Any type of rings with stones on them. Gum chewing is not, real, is not professional. Uh, any visible tattoos. Cell phones are not permitted out in the clinical area. So if you have to keep your cell phone on you, uh, you wanna make sure that it's on silence and we don't want you using your cell phone. So if you need to look up something, you, you can go on the computer and look up something for that's clinical related, that's fine. You shouldn't be on your cell phones during clinical. Arriving on time is very, very important. Your, instru your clinical instructor is gonna tell you what time you need to be on the floor and you need to be there. On time, ready to go to take care of patients. Remember, one minute late is late, and that's going to be a practice that you should get used to because when you start working in a hospital, that they're going to enforce that, that policy. Christiana Care is very strict about being on time. If you're one minute late, it's a late, and I've seen people fired because they've had too many lates. Um, you know, obviously, um, sometimes there's going to be traffic or maybe parking so far away. Remember, you have to allot enough time to get there on time. So even though the T-lot is really far, you have to park in the T-lot. If, if you are caught parking somewhere else, if security sees you and those green uniforms that are dead giveaway for Dell Tech students walking through a lot that you're not supposed to be in, Dell Tech is, is going to get in trouble for it. So we want to make sure that we're abiding by their rules when we're on their property. Even if you're working there, and you're leaving work and going to clinical, you need to move your car to the T lot so that when you walk out in your Dell Tech uniform, you're walking to the correct lot. And then um, absences and latenesses, you wanna communicate with your clinical instructor about this. You know, things happen and you might, you might be running late. 
So make sure that you just let your clinical instructor know that you're coming and that you're going to be a few minutes late. If you're going to be absent, please let the instructor know as soon as, as, soon as you know, because uh, we're making assignments and we're based on you being there. So um, that would change how our morning looks. So please let us know as soon as possible if you're not going to be um, there for clinical that day. And then again, we want you to review the, um, the, the student um, policy manual and as well as your clinical notebook for more information about that. Pre and post conference. So this is gonna be specific to your unit with your instructor. You know, we usually meet before we go on the floor and then we meet at the end of the day. Uh, different instructors do things differently. So when we, get, when we do breakout rooms later, your specific instructor will tell you uh, how your clinical uh, floor is going to work. Some floors provide us places for, you, for us to sit and talk afterwards, and some floors don't have that. So we might have to go down to the library and, and do our post-conference down there. It just depends. And we've also uh, added post-conference. We're going to do our QSIN um, uh, competencies during post-conference as well, and we're going to talk about that later in this presentation. Okay, back to you. Okay, so clinical paperwork is fairly similar to what you've experienced already. Um, we're going to go into these in more detail, but here's the list. So medication pass sheet, assessment sheet, lab sheet, and clinical reasoning tool. These are all found under D2L um, under the clinical tab for you to print. So please print extras um, as you're preparing for the next few weeks, because sometimes you'll have a friend who doesn't have one, or maybe you drop them, whatever it is, just print extra so that you're prepared. It would be um, a good way to start the, the process. So the medication pass sheet, I do not have an example of however you've seen them before. There's um, columns broken down into action, why my patient needs it, um, nursing implications. So you're going to complete this prior to your medication administration experience. So and you want to focus on the medication as it's indicated for this patient. One example here could be metoprolol, right? Sometimes we think metoprolol is for high blood pressure. But if you have a patient that's in atrial fibrillation, it's to keep their rate under control. So say your patient has had jumps in heart rate up to 165, and you write blood pressure on that sheet. You're not really tying in to that patient. It's, it's not not for high blood pressure, but for that patient, it's for rate control. So trying to really tease that out. And you can ask us, you know, Justine, Jen, Rashan, I, I know this is for this, but my patient's not exhibiting this. What do you think? So kind of use us um, in that way. And then remember, you can bring this reference with you into the, um, for the medication pass. So if you get your medication out, you can look at it and say, okay, nursing implications, I need to dilute this. Justine, I looked this up earlier on formulary. It says I need to dilute with 2.5 mLs. And I'm like, yes, great, you're very well prepared. So nursing implications on this form are also very helpful for you. So looking up dilution, the time of administration, and what, what kind of um, compatibilities it has so that you are very well prepared when it's time to draw that medication up and give it for your specific patient. So that's how things are going to be changing from 170, 180, 190 as we're moving into 200 that you're putting a few more pieces together like you guys all said earlier. Am I still this one, Jen? Yeah, that's you. Okay. So then the assessment sheet, this hasn't changed much, um, but I have an example here we can go through in a minute. If it's not documented, then it wasn't done. Please remember that. So if you're, if it's not applicable to your patient, place a line through it or put NA so that we know, yes, your patient is not on mechanical ventilation. Most of them are not in this scenario, but put a line through that says not applicable at this time or in the note section so that we know that you looked at it and you thought about what it might be, and then it's not applicable in that scenario. Um, remember that assessment data for Tuesday should be clearly marked. And this is something they really push for in 210, so we get you started here. A reassessment is so important from day um, one to day two, right? So if your patient on day one had clear lung sounds, and on day two, 
they have crackles, we want to make sure you're really aware of that change because that is the nursing process where things and priorities are constantly changing. So a good idea would be using a different color pen. I've seen people also use different color highlighters to differentiate and then using that note section to really talk about the differences. Um, example here, let me pull this up. Can you still see my screen with the example? Yes. Yep. It's loading. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so here's an example. This one's using highlighters, right? So this is Dr. Lake. Um, she has assessed her patient. It's week four. She has the patient's initials. She has their code status, their allergies, um, their diagnosis, right? So sometimes their diagnosis will change. What did they start with and where are they now? Precautions are so important vital signs. And then you see how she has irregularities. So underneath on the note, it's talking about that intermittent irregular heart, heart rate because your abnormals, we should be discussing whether there's something we need to do about it and what we did. So, um, so they did a 12 lead EKG. They said, oh, this is just some PACs or PVCs. It's the, the cardiologist said it's not a big deal. And we they don't need telemetry. So it's really getting you to understand that abnormalities, we need to support why we've done something or why we haven't done something. And then it goes into, um, you know, the whole head to toe assessment. Is this new or um, have you seen all this before? Can someone speak out and tell me? That's familiar. Familiar, okay, right. So a lot of the things you've seen before. Um, incentive spirometry. Do we need a nursing note for that? A nurse, I'm sorry, do we need an order for that? Doctor's order. Anybody know what incentive no. spirometry is? No. Right, so we don't need an, a doctor's order because that's that little plastic thing with the tube on it that your patient breathes in and watches the bar go up. So that is how your patient is um, preventing pneumonia by expanding and atelectasis by expanding those lungs. So you as the one-to-one -one student are going to start incentive spirometry, then that's listed here. So a lot of different um, things to look through and familiarize yourself with before you get on the floor so that you know it's easier. You don't have to like say, hey, Justine, what's incentive spirometry? When you get on the floor, you'll be able to already know, does my patient ha have this or can I initiate this? Um, IV assessment, you're gonna want to include for sure. And then also any fluids, a site, site condition, psychosocial assessment. In the end, really deciding, um, this, this doesn't really go into the, there's a discharge summary that goes on, that's on the end. And including like your own assessment of that, is this patient able to be discharged at this time? What is preventing them from being discharged? And what do you anticipate for their future? Do you think they're gonna need a skilled nursing facility? Um, someone took, typed a note in the chat down, will you check that out? Uh, so the question is, do you have to type it or can it be handwritten? Oh, it can definitely be handwritten. So some people like to type it, but um, as you're getting into this uh, current, I guess, as you're, as you're moving up to 200, we try to get your paperwork in on uh, earlier. So getting you to do it while you're at um, the bedside, almost similar to if you were writing notes on your patient and you needed to get your documentation done. So you can type it, but it's preferred that you actually write it. All right. And Jen, are you this next one for yeah. assessment sheets? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so don't forget those extra uh, paperwork that's that's gonna be listed. So you have your, your med pass, your lab sheet, your clinical reasoning tool. And um, you wanna make sure that if your patient requires a neurovascular check or a neurological check, these two documents are there for you. So uh, 
this a lot of times gets forgotten. When you first get your patient and you, and you go look up your patient, one of the first things you should be doing is looking at orders and see what the orders are. If you see anybody that has a Q4 neuro check, you're going to need to go print out or pull out a neurological assessment sheet and you're going to have to do that on that patient. But you, we also want you thinking like a nurse. If you have a patient that all of a sudden has a change in mental status, that's a good time to do a neuro check on them. So you want to you want to do the assessment and then fill out the paperwork. If you have any type of patient that has something going on with an extremity, they had um, uh, some kind of traumatic uh, injury to an arm or leg, or they um, they had surgery on an arm or leg. Well, then you're going to be doing neurovascular checks on that patient. So you're going to have to you're going to be checking for edema and pulses and sensation and motor strength. And we want we want you thinking along those lines and filling out that paperwork and, uh, as well. So just because the instructor doesn't say go pull that sheet out and do it, as as the nurses, you should be thinking about this is an assessment my patient needs, and we need to and we need to make sure that we get this done. Okay, next one. Then the uh, the lab flow sheet is going to be where you're going to document your labs, and what you're looking for really is trends. So you need to know what each each lab is for, and then you have to be able to apply it to your patient. That's the hardest part when you're looking at these lab values, that's what our students struggle with the most is to be able to provide an explanation of the abnormal results and why it, that's happening to your patient. So we're gonna, um, we have an example of what your lab flow sheet should look like. So if you have a, a white blood count and you, it has the normal values there and you can see your patients is low, why, why is your patient slow? Um, and then you're gonna, we want you to explain that in the, in the patho for abnormals in the right-hand column. So you can see how we, we thought it out. You wanna apply that pathophysiology. Tell us what's going on in the body and why your patient, what's happening to your patient that's making that value be off. We want you to think about those things because they're very important when you're, when you're caring for your patient with their diagnosis. The same thing um, with the neutrophils, then you're, you're breaking out those white blood cells into the different categories. So your white blood count is low, but your neutrophils are high. Why is that happening? You need to be thinking about that and, and deciding um, what's going on and explaining it. And this is really hard. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. This is, this is very, very hard to think this out and critically think through it. That's what we're trying to get you to do. Um, not just telling us what's going on, but being able to ask the why question. Why is this happening? And explaining that to us. That's that, that deeper thinking in nursing. And you can see there, there's a whole bunch of them examples. And I'll put this under clinical so you guys can review these examples under the clinical D2L tab. Okay, then we're going to move on to the clinical reasoning tool on our slide here. So, so this is where you get to put all the pieces together for your patient. Um, the, your patient's going to be there and you're going to, if you go into their HMP, I always like to cheat, go into the HMP, the doctors fill out every system what the problem is and what's going and what we need to take care of that problem. And it's, it's everything from the, the reason they came in to prior problems to psychosocial problems. It could be a depression issue. And they try to put those problems in order of priority. So use the top one is usually the most, the highest priority for that, for the doctor anyway. So you want to look through your list of priority of problems. And then I want you to pick out what's the priority problem for your patient on Monday that you're taking care of that patient because some of those problems might be from a week ago when they were admitted and they're no longer relevant. So you need to look at those problems and figure out which one is the priority. And then you need to kind of put all the pieces together. You have to talk about what assessments did you do to um, come to that determination? And here's an example that Justine's pulling up for you. What, what are the assessments? What were the abnormal assessments that led you to believe that that is the problem that we need to take care of? So in this example, infection was the priority problem. So what are some things that we saw that lead us to infection? So there you see the heart rate is elevated. They're having pain. Um, it's possible um, it's possible that fever could be on there. If, if the patient had a fever, if they were febrile, they could, you could put that as a physical assessment. And then you're gonna look at abnormal labs and diagnostic tests. And we're gonna, we see that the white blood count was 16. So some kind of infection going on there. And then you're gonna talk about relative 
relevant medications for the infection. Remember, we want to focus. This is this is the hard part too for for the students. They they start putting everything down. They start mixing their problems and they start listing all the medications the patient is on. We don't want to know that. If you pick a priority problem of infection, what medications are, are they on that are dealing with the infection? So you can see here they're on antibiotics. And then, and then we want you to think like a nurse. We want you to come up with goals, we were actions. What are you going to implement? What are you going to do to make sure that you're taking care of this problem? And then you're going to evaluate, reassess, and then talk about that there is also a section on here for discharge planning because that's really important too. What are some, we want you to not only talk about what are we going to do to get them out of the hospital, but when they get home, what are, the, what are some problems that you might foresee that are going to prevent them from going home? Can they go home? How many steps are there? Is there someone there to support them and take care of them? These are all things that we want you thinking about. And then there's also a box on the pathophysiology, which some students struggle with. So if you're going to pick, if they have an infection and it's in this case, it's caused by the diverticulitis. We want you to tell us all about diverticulitis so that the next time you see a patient with diverticulitis, you're going to have, you're going to be able to have some back knowledge and you're going to be able to draw from this. And you're going to know that, that it's an infection of the small diverticulum, which is an outpouching of the colon. You need to know that. And then you can um, apply these things to future patients to test questions lots of different areas. Okay, so this is this, this is um, under your clinical um, in one of the tabs. It already has this example, so you can follow along. If you're struggling with clinical reasoning tool, you need to pull this up and, and to look at it as you're an example as you're doing it. All right, Justine, back to you. Okay, so going into resources. So when you're doing the, this paperwork, especially that clinical reasoning tool, um, I want you guys to be using formulary. So this is these are CCHS uh, portal things that will make sure you know where to find. So formulary is your medications, um, and that's specific to Christiana Care. Um, and then Lippincott Procedures or Advisor. Has anyone seen this before? If you have, um, you can tell me in the chat, but this is this advisor is a great tool when you're in clinical trying to come up with nursing actions and um, goals for your patient for that clinical reasoning tool, as well as our C clinical practice guidelines and clinical medical guidelines. And then I added an ATI because ATI skills modules are going to be taking over your clinical skills book in the next year or so. So the ATI skills modules are under your apply tab and they are full of information and quizzes and interactive videos where you can really um, brush up on your skills. So when you break, get into your breakout rooms, we're going to tell you what kind of skills you might anticipate um, to do more of. So really kind of getting into that uh, mindset of let me look this stuff up before I get to the clinical setting just to refresh um, as well as your clinical notebook, there are so many organizational tools in there for you to plan your day and just extra information. So just peruse that. And then, like we said, clinical nursing skills textbook um, is going away over the next um, semester or so, but it's still, you guys have it. It's a great resource to use for when you are in the clinical setting. And again, um, the R2 library is under my DTCC. There's directions to get there on the NSR. And these are all free resources. So Davis Drug Guide is great. It gives um, you ideas on action, on why my patient might be on this medication, calculating drug doses, um, pharmacology for nurses second edition, pharmacology made incredibly easy, <laughs> pharmacology clear and simple. These are all farm resources that really are helpful. Davis um, Handbook of Laboratory and Diagnostic te Tests, I really also like for when you're trying to understand what kind of um, diagnostic test your patient has. And there's a section um, under the lab sheet that talks about diagnostics. And you guys can look and see what do these results mean? You know, they're given in these big medical terminologies. But if you look through this laboratory book and diagnostic book, it will explain it to you in more layman's terms. And we're kind of getting away from nursing diagnosis manual, um, but for prioritization, those nursing diagnoses are still 
helpful because it helped you to figure out um, what's the nursing goals for your patient with a certain problem. And then for computer charting, when you are on uh, the floor. So remember, you are in charge of charting vital signs and you have to look and see whether those vital signs, how often they are due. Um, lots of step down floors are Q4 hours, which could mean right when you get there and in the middle of your shift or maybe at the end. So please be aware of when your floor does vital signs and communicate that to uh, the techs on the floor that you will be taking those vital signs. Um, in input and output. So if your patient is on strict input and output, you need to make sure you are measuring how much you're giving them and how much they're getting out. <clears throat> and this includes drains. So if your patient has a chest tube or a surgical drain, it is going to be your job to um, empty the drain or mark the drain and put that into the output. Also activity of daily living or meaningful rounds. So the goal of the floor, uh, floors in general, are to go see the patient at least hourly. They're called hourly rounds and really just a quick check-in. How are you doing? Do you have to go to the bathroom? Are you hungry? Do you need something to drink? Um, do you need to pull your sheets up or reposition change, especially if someone is bed bound, those position changes are so important. But we need to be aware that we are documenting these things as the, the nursing student. So I, when we get to the floor, there is a section that we will talk about that activities of daily living that you guys would, can, uh, should be charting every hour. And just a sidebar, we are not documenting a head to toe in, in power chart. So the head to toe is specifically just what you will hand to us, but it is not going in the computer for that patient. However, you can look up and, and see what that nurse has charted um, for their head to toe and compare, you know, if you heard crackles, if that nurse heard clear lung sounds, is there a change in that patient? Or did you hear something that maybe wasn't crackles, you know, so really getting you to learn about this assessment is, is ideal there. Um, and then, all right, let's get into medication administration. So first and foremost, we are going to make sure we communicate with our nurse, which times and medications the, um, I don't know, I, I must have written that in when I was half asleep. So what that means, <laughs> the first part, tell the nurse which times and medications you're giving to the patient and which patient. Um, because communication is so important, you know, we, we might end up forgetting to tell the nurse and then they give those meds and we lose an experience. So really just communicating right from the get-go, right as we're giving getting report from our nurse that you are doing those medications and the times. Um, it's an expectation that before we give meds, you complete that med pass sheet and you can review it during the med pass. Review the EMAR and provider orders for changes, especially right before you're giving those medications. So at the top, there's a little refresh icon on power chart. You make sure it's up to date. Sometimes it'll, I'll see the students will say like three hours and 40 minutes and it's just because you're not used to refreshing the screen to see what has changed. So making sure you're doing that. Um, and it's expectation that you will prepare all meds equipment and do med calculations. So in general, during your first med pass, we will do it together. And then but as clinical grows, depending on your clinical instructor, you can potentially prepare the medications ahead of time and then show us what you have as we go into the room together. So that's kind of a growth, growth thing that will happen during this clinical. It is expected that before we come to you that you check, you check the IV access, the dates of IV tubing. So whether that's that 96 hours for continuous or 24 for intermittent, we need to know if the fluid needs to be changed, if there is a flush bag and if there is compatibility. So this is bringing back that um, you're trying to figure out if you're, if you're giving an IV push through a compatible line, an incompatible line, or an IVR. So remember bringing that back, review those videos from 180, 190. And then remember, you must have an instructor present while administering medications. Even if the nurse says to you, hey, Jen, 
do you want to give this um, IV push to lauded? And you're like, yeah, I really do. And you go in and do it with the nurse. That That's something that we can't have, we can't be doing anymore. So um, if you would like to have that opportunity, you can draw up the medication with the nurse and then I would be there to, while well, you give the medication. Um, if that's something that we communicate to each other. And then being unprepared could equal a missed learning opportunity. So try to be as prepared as you can for these med passes and look them up on formulary before we come over so that we can just work through um, and get to that med pass. So back in 180, 190, um, med passes took about half an hour, even for POs because of the the need, the, you know, the need to check everything and how new and green you guys were to this. Our goal for this, for this, um, for 200 is about 15 minutes, you know, to do a med pass because it's getting you to the point where you're going to have five med passes to do. So we're, we're trying to bring that time down a little bit as you grow. Okay. Organization and time management. It's crucial as students to be able to figure this out and to, and to implement it, but it's something that you're going to use for the rest of your, your career as a nurse. Um, even to this day, when I go in to, to get an assignment, I have a plan. I have a routine that I do. I, I, have, um, I have it all mapped out because I know there's so much to do and I don't want to forget anything. So to make sure that I stay on track, I'm very organized and I manage out my, my shift. And you gotta manage the whole shift from the very beginning. So after you get out of your pre-conference, you wanna, you wanna try to make a plan for yourself and have some kind of routine that you're gonna establish and, and that you're gonna stick to even as you, as you move on through the program and into practice. Um, first thing you wanna do, go in and see your patient. Always patient first, go in the room. If they're awake, introduce yourself to them. And um, this is before you even get report. Just make sure they're in the bed, they have their, their um, call bell, they're breathing. If they're awake, you, you're gonna introduce who you are and that you're gonna be back to see them. If they're asleep, you let them sleep at that time. And then when you go out, you get on that computer and you wanna look up, the first thing you wanna do is go to the orders. Orders change minute to minute. I had, a, I had a student that was, in, we did all of our, we did our first two checks outside the room. We went in the room, we were doing our third check at the bedside and the doctor had DC'd the antibiotic so we weren't giving it anymore. So you have to review the current orders and always make sure that you're going off the, off the most recent stuff that the doctors put in. And you wanna write down all the things that you're gonna need to do throughout your whole shift because you have to manage that time out. Then you have to look at all the, any type of treatments that you have to do or dressing changes. Uh, how many meals are we going to do? When, do they have AccuChecks? How many times am I going to have to take their blood pressure? Am I going to have to do a neuro check? Um, if they have drains, when do I, when do I empty them? How often am I emptying them? Am I able to chart on, I have to keep charting it live. When you, when you take something out of a drain, you want to make sure you put it right into the eyes and O's live. You don't want to wait till the end of the shift to do that. When you're doing your hourly rounds, you want to make sure that you go and you document it right away because you want it to be live. The doctor comes along, they want to be able to say all these things. So you have to plan this stuff out. So the first thing after you go through your orders, you figure out all the things you need to do in the time that you're going to be there. And then you get into report. When you get out of report, you're going to get into meds. After meds, they're, they're, they take some time. And then you got to start doing all your AM care. You got to ambulate your patient. Maybe you have to do the incentive spirometer with them. Maybe you have to turn your patient. Maybe they need to be cleaned up. Lots of things going on on the floor. You need to be organized. So having a plan from the beginning and getting into a routine is going to be something you need to establish. And this is the best time to do it when we're in clinical and you have an instructor right there helping you. Um, there's lots of resources that can help you as well. So if you need any help with any of that or you're not good at time management and organization, let your clinical instructor know and they will help you with that. Okay, go ahead on to the next one. And then this is how we're gonna evaluate you. So every week you're gonna get a clinical evaluation um, done and you're gonna get to see it. It's gonna, we rate you from one to four in, in a bunch of different areas. And then we're gonna, there's an area where we can write, write out some things that you did, good things you did, things you need to work on. And we keep track. And the, and the idea is that you get better each week and you score better each week because um, maybe at the beginning you did something that was not acceptable or it didn't meet 
and you got a one or a two. So our expectation is by the end of the six weeks, you're you're at the um, the meets expectation for that, and you, that you've figured out how to do it, and you've proven that you can do it. Maybe you had to go practice it, but it it got done. So in order to pass, you have to the you you know you need to meet everything. So by the last week, you have to have meets in all the categories in order to um, pass clinical. If you're not doing something correctly and you're going to score a one or a two, that is something that your clinical instructor is going to pull you aside and talk to you about. So you should you should know that something wasn't right. You're going to talk about what what happened, how it could be better, how we're going to improve on it, and they may have to give you what we call a clinical success plan. So we can go to the next slide. Clinical success plan. This is not punitive. Everyone, I, I know it feels awful when you get one, but it's it's to, we're trying to make you better because we want you to meet all of those clinical objectives. So uh, if, if there's something that on the floor you, you had trouble with your medications and you didn't do a good job with that, we're going to talk to you about it. We're going to talk about how we could have been better. We're going to give you a, a CSP that goes over everything we've talked about so that you have some, we have something in writing for you so that you can reference back. This is what I wasn't doing and now I know this is what I'm, what I'm doing correctly. Uh, other things that we could give you is a lab referral, which is we're gonna refer you to the lab to practice a skill. Maybe you haven't done a Foley in a while and you got the opportunity to do one and it didn't go so well. We might send you back to the lab to practice that. You might have to be remediated on it. If you have to be remediated, then you have to practice the skill on your own and then you have to meet with one of the lab instructors, either Jan Hurst or Diane Bradley to get signed off on um, that, you, that you did it correctly. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of resources for you as well um, to be able to be successful in clinical. And don't forget if you're late, remember one minute late is late, you, there, you can get a CSP for that. If you're absent, you're gonna get a CSP for that. So um, latenesses and absences shouldn't be any surprise if you receive a CSP. Anything else that you're gonna get a CSP for your clinical instructor should have pulled you aside and talked to you about before they send it. Okay, Justine, back to you. Okay, so along with what we just talked about, um, this is a great opportunity to practice. So independent skill practice is back. I don't know if you guys got to do it last time or not. I think you did. But um, it's not mandatory, but it's highly encouraged. So you're going to see D2L for the lab practice times. And to register, you're going to go to clinical and labs, and then clinical, and then independent skills practice. And then you'll see there how many slots are available to sign up. So I know that John is ready and waiting for you for you all. And um, you can practice any skill in there. So you know, if you're on my floor, 4D has a bunch of na uh, nasogastric tubes, practice that. Um, Jen has central lines and ports. So, you know, really being aware of the skills that you're going to be seeing and practice them. Okay, so this is not a new topic, but HIPAA. Um, some things to remember with HIPAA, right? So you're going to discard data sheets in designated shred bins. Those are those tall blue recycle bins that you see on the floors. Um, some clinical instructors like to collect them as kind of your ticket to leave the floor. Others just say throw them out on your own. So you're not allowed to take anything home that you've printed, anything that could have patient information on it needs to be thrown out and started over the next day. So if you're someone like me who likes to take lots of notes, um, do it on a separate piece of paper because you're going to be throwing those data sheets out. And uh, remember, access only patient charts that you're assigned to or providing care to. So if I'm get, doing vital signs to help Michon out and I'm doing them, I can go into that patient's chart and put those vital signs in because I'm providing them care. But if my neighbor down the street is here, I cannot click into their chart. If they're Even if they're asking me, hey, Justine, can you check and see what my CAT scan results show? I, I am not able to um, based on HIPAA. Remember, don't photocopy or take any pictures of charts and materials. As wonderful as it would be to have an EKG strip on your patient, we are not allowed to copy those things. Remember to log off your computer or devices. Um, is it F2 or F5, Jen? F2, is that how you save it? I always I think forget. So. I, I think, think it's F2. F2. So that's, um, if, you, if you want to save your spot, you can hit F2 or you can scan and that will save your spot, but it will make the screen dark. So remember 
these little tips and tricks um, if you're going to be stepping away even for a second. And then another thing, it's so exciting to be in clinical. We love to talk about our patients and we will have that opportunity in post-conference, but please refrain from chatting about patients or even conditions. So if, you're, if you've had a patient and they just had um, an extensive surgery with details, those details could be specific enough that their, their, their daughter is sitting next to you and hears you talking and knows you're talking about them. So just refrain from any of that until we're in post-conference and we have that time to share. Okay, so something new we are doing this time is an awesome opportunity for you guys. So for this experience, you will follow the nurse throughout the shift and this will be assigned week one. So you'll know which week you are going to be doing this pre preceptorship role. Um, during this role, you're not going to be doing any meds unless I uh, or the instructor is present. Skills are allowed, but you, your goal is going to be, you're going to follow that nurse anywhere they go. And don't worry, we will be talking to these nurses beforehand. So they will know that it's an expectation that you are going to be their shadow. And the goal here is to reflect on your experience, not just about the nurse, but how, how you would handle the assignment if you were the nurse. So we're putting you in the nurse's shoes as someone who has to manage all of these things during the chaos, during the five patients needing different things and needing meds. And I want you to really reflect on that. So during this week that you are the preceptee, you will complete this reflection assignment. Okay, so here is the, the assignment. You will not have to do other paperwork on this week. So during this week, it's just um, this, this paper. So this reflection should be approximately two pages double-spaced and you're going to go through these key points, okay? So overall experience, and I know you guys can all read, so I'm just gonna kind of highlight the key points, um, but think about what you, what you learned, what surprised you, review your patient's assignment and list their diagnosis and the care that you saw, um, discuss prioritization, and um, this will help you as you get into test questions, right? Like which one did the nurse see first? Why do you think they saw them first? Would you see someone else first? Um, remembering that, which one was the most challenging? Um, discuss any interdisciplinary communication, right? So did, were, did the nurse have to call the provider to ask for a medication? How did that go? Um, any delegation? So remember there are texts on this floor. So the nurses use them so often for to help, but there's also a good way to um, to have teamwork. And so talking about that um, therapeutic communication with your patient, did the nurse um, do anything to help the patient make a, a big choice or you know help them with their fears? Informatics is um, something that I added in because you guys are going to be potentially tested on this on the NCLEX. Um, just examples like EHR, like the, the health record for, you know, power chart, the med scanner, different things that we use on the floor that are technology based. Um, and then finally, I'm not finally data collection. So you'll notice um, there are whiteboards. Uh, Jen, I don't know for if 6E is like this or not, but th there's whiteboards on the floor that say what we're currently working on. You know, we had no one's fallen in. 12 days and then there's no been no UTIs and things like that. Do you have is there a spot? Every every, every floor has them and that's they're supposed to be doing huddles and it's okay. good, and all the information is on those boards. Okay, yeah. So uh, that's actually something I was going to say about this project. It, if you are the preceptee, they I expect you guys to be part of that huddle, listening to the floor data as the charge nurse talks about it or the manager. Um, discuss change of shift. So that's that's there too. And then any skills you you completed or observed should go there too. This is just something new that we're trying to start to get you guys to think about prioritization management. Okay, and and I hope I, everyone saw that this um, two page paper is due on Wednesday by two o'clock for day shift and Wednesday night by 2200 for evening shift. 
uh, students, okay? All right, so then that brings us into our QSIN competencies. So QSIN is quality and safety in nursing. And different organizations years ago, back in the early 2000s, came, decided that there, was, there were too many poor outcomes. There was too many uh, safety issues, too many things going on in, the, in healthcare that were all preventable. And then they started looking even deeper into these things and realized that nurses are at the forefront of it and we're right there. And we could probably catch a lot of this stuff before it happens. So then nursing decided they were gonna come up with these competencies to establish an actual um, organization that um, works on, on these different areas. So we're gonna put these into effect for you guys in terms of you're gonna watch on your floors, whatever clinical unit you are on, and you're gonna look for these things. And it's great in that preceptor, preceptorship paper, a lot of this stuff was mentioned, teamwork, informatics, safety, all those things that, that we can do as nurses to, to, keep, to get the best outcomes for our patients. So they divided it into six competencies. As we go through the next six weeks, we're going to assign, a, we're gonna pick four competencies and we're gonna assign two to um, two students in our group. So, each of you will get one of the competencies and you will uh, present each week in post-conference. I know that sounds really confusing, but it's not. So say two students are assigned um, patient-centered care and they're gonna be, and they are gonna be um, talking about what they see with their patients on patient-centered care. And then in post-conference, they're gonna talk to their group about patient-centered care and and what they learned, what they saw the nurses do, what they thought could have been done better maybe to, to have more patient-centered care. The only criteria for this is prior to your presentation in post-conference, you're gonna to have to find an article that's related to the patient-centered care that you're gonna talk about and just check with your instructor to make sure that it is um, a valid peer-reviewed article and has good research in it. Um, we, We'll talk more about this when we break out into our individual clinical groups and your clinical instructor will explain exactly how it's gonna work on your floor, but it's, it's, pretty, it's generally gonna be the same for all of you. So by the end of, of the six weeks, you will, we will have gone through all of the competencies and been able to relate it to things that we actually see on the floor, okay? Um, and like I said, we'll talk more about this when we get to our, our breakouts. And I yeah, think so one big thing, sorry, Jen, not to interrupt, I just wanted to highlight that it's under D2L under the clinical tab. So if you would like to look at it more on your own um, with the specifics to that QSYN competency project, you can find it under there. All right, I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions for us? I do have questions.